Hello, lecture four, sustainability challenges. Now, hopefully, this is going to be the last lecture that um, you have online. Um, hopefully, the next ones I'm going to, to be able to join you. Um, now, so let's talk about this one, yeah? And the whole idea is that we can address in a much more specific way the sustainability challenges by going through all the tools that the Millennium Ecosystem system has uh, provided. We are much more specific here because we can talk about the ecosystems and the impact of ecosystem services on human well-being. We are going to use as the main references chapters 2, 3 and 4 of the book you can see on slide 2. Now, so let's start. Ecosystem services. There are different ecosystem services. It goes, as we mentioned before, from dry lands to forests or to mountains and, and polar environments to, to islands or coastal. Uh, we can have cultivated, uh, very important for our food. So there, there are many and they are all different in the way that life relates so they do have different biodiversity and that and the way that life uh, organize itself is different so the question of disruption of ecosystems resilience of ecosystems and what we can get from ecosystems is what's at stake now after many years uh, scientists fighting over the best framework to explore how different ecosystems can be understood in terms of their impact, we have the formulation of slide four. Now, uh, normally, it will come naturally that when we think about the impacts, we think about provisioning. If we think about provisioning, uh, is what we did when we discussed climate change. We think about food, we think about fresh water, we think about energy, we think about fuel, so uh, that's what's provisioning, yeah. But what's the innovation of this framework is that they added in a systematic way regulation and cultural services. Now regulation is essential when we are talking about um, climate change because climate is basically about regulation but we also can be in a position of flood regulation or disease regulation as in the recent uh, case um, we, we have seen now from China but also water purification can be a question of regulation normally through forests so uh, part of those services not simply about direct provisioning it's, it's about regulation as well but also um, ecosystem services they do have a cultural dimension or a spiritual dimension where they can go from the very simple recreational and educational to the more serious aspects uh, of intimacy, spiritual intimacy that people might have with nature. So these are the three main blocks and we acknowledge that before that we have some supporting uh, elements which are supporting to, to the environment as well such as the nutrient cycle. Yeah? Now, uh, so what's the impact of all this provisioning, regulating, cultural into what is human well-being? Now, when it comes to human well-being, uh, this framework was, um, was supported by the writings of a Cambridge economist, uh, Partha Dasgupta, because he was the one introducing this notion of constituents of well-being, and this is important because these uh, recognize that well-being is multidimensional, that we do have a material aspect for a good life, but as we have health, as we have good social relations, as we have notions of security. So we can add more, yeah? But the fact is that constituents of well-being reflect a multidimensional aspect of human well-being. Uh, but it doesn't um, cover everything, and that's why you do have another column for freedom of choice and action, which basically reflects a uh, sense contribution. So you have um, half of it coming from the Gupta, 
half of it coming from sand. There are multidimensionality in the idea of constituents of human well-being. So the whole issue of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was to, was to frame the impacts. How can we define the arrows that you can see, uh, the thickness of these arrows, uh, and in what direction? So it's a question of intensity and a question of quality of, uh, of the interaction. But again, I repeat, the framework is relevant because it allows us to think of ecosystem services in a much more specific way, in ecosystem services also in a multidimensional way and relate multidimensionally um, to, to human well-being. So what the framework does is that it tries to, to systematize the causes. But scientists, they do not like this word, cause. They use drivers for that. So they go for indirect causes or drivers of change to direct drivers of change, which are indirect, are things that do not um, affect directly ecosystems, such as demography, population growth. If we have more people, we know that more people need more food, and then that would be an impact in land use. But um, demographics itself is not something direct. We also know that economic arrangements, the level of globalization, the level of trade, different policy frameworks, they are indirect because they are not about directly using any of the ecosystem services. And that would go for science, technology, that would go for cultural and, and religious factors and that would go to governance and other social political factors. So we do have indirect drivers of change, they should be taken into account, that's why they are in the framework, but then we can, we can see, we can relate them to direct drivers uh, of change and that would be how land is used. So that would relate to property rights, but that would go for the kind of crops that countries decide to incentivize or what species are being introduced, GMO, whatever, what species are being uh, removed, how they are adapting to the indirect drivers of markets. Also, the whole issue of technology, what kinds of seeds, what kind of equipment, or if they are using inputs such as irrigation, it's important. Things related to climate change, they are always going to be there. And also other drivers that could be external, such as the, the, the biological characteristic of the place that, uh, of that particular ecosystem. So all these drivers, they will impact on ecosystem services and then ecosystem services will have an impact on human well-being through the three different categories that we have discussed. Now, uh, what is uh, relevant in all the work which was carried out by 700 scientists plus of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment is that they compiled all evidence that was available about the change in the ecosystem services in recent decades, just the ecosystem services trying to, to comply or to cope with these demands for food, fresh water, energy. And what they have seen is that they have uh, provided as um, requested, but they have uh, lost ability to uh, to deliver further so at the same time that they have increased all the provisioning they have weakened nature's ability to deliver other services so and there's a direct link between increasing provisioning and decreasing regulation yeah now um, Look at the map on slide 7, if you can. Uh, you are going to see that um, uh, you have the cultivated systems uh, in darker brown. 
that cover 25% uh, of Earth's terrestrial surface. And uh, this is actually, um, if we look at the Amazon region now, is not as it was 20 years ago. And we have seen that more land was converted after 1950s than in 150 years before. So what the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, or MA for short, did is that they compiled all this evidence. So it's not a question of, I think, no, it's the evidence and the maps and the figures and the statistics that show how different ecosystems have been affected. So as far as land is concerned, we have seen an int intensification in, in the use of land. As far as, as marine systems or sea systems uh, are concerned, uh, there are many, many different stories, but we know that uh, is a system that has been under pressure. There has been a collapse of fisheries. We are talking about um, people who are living in dry regions that are very vulnerable uh, because they cannot get from land so they would go into um, fishing and they also have been affected by the collapsing of fishing stocks. Uh, we also know that everything has been under uh, additional pressure because of increasing temperature, temperature. so you can see in the next graph um, one thing you have seen before, th those chains, but this is a long-term graph, so you can see very constant in terms of temperature and increase, and how uh, this affect uh, the capacity that land has to, to cope uh, uh, with all these demands. So as we have seen an increase in the use of fertilizers, an increase in, in output, we have seen that the capacity for fixing nitrogen has been constant and more recently decreasing. So the difficulty is not simply what has been achieved. If what has been achieved is actually a story of success. Um, if you only look at that, but is uh, how the ecosystems ended up, what's the state of ecosystems after these recent increases. Now another thing to take into account is species extinction. And look at the red bar, which is just the projection of future species. So we think about one or two, the most visible ones, you can see campaigns by WWF on that, but uh, the predict prediction of a sort of massive wave of um, extinctions in the future is something that can affect uh, in many different ways, uh, not simply the provision but the cultural, or the regulating services of ecosystems, yeah, and with the whole impact that it would have for the sustainable development goals, for poverty reduction, for the issue of inequality that we, we mentioned before, and more directly to, uh, to hunger and to food security. Now, at the same time, let me repeat that we have seen an increase in total production and intensification of use of fertilizers in the world. We see that in many regions erosion processes have increased and is this balance between what has been achieved so far, which if you only look at the outputs, they, they look good, but how the different ecosystems are, are coping which are in this, this state uh, are not um, very resilient at the moment, which, which lies uh, the tension of this report. So look at the status of provision of services. For food, it's okay for crops, it's okay for livestock, but fisheries have been going down. 
Uh, of course, some of the fisheries have been replaced by aquaculture, but also wild foods have been have been uh, going down. If you look to fiber, it's just a mixture and down for wood fuel. Of course, when you talk about that, you're talking about people who depend on wood fuel because some others might just use that for, for pleasure when they go to their house in the mountains for two weeks. Yeah? But everything else in terms of provision, from genetic resources to biochemicals to fresh water, which is key, they are going down. So um, it, that per se would be reason for concern. Let, let's look a little bit more, uh, or let's look closely, or a little bit closer to the issue of water. So from 5 to uh, up to 25 percent of global fresh water use would be above what is considered the long-term accessible supplies. It's interesting to, to see the language that IPCC and the Millennium Ecosystem Assessments would employ. They would say from low to medium certainty. So for all estimates you would have the second level which is the degree of certainty in which you are stating or claiming something else. A similar statement but at a higher level up to 35 percent would go to irrigation withdrawals that would be above supply rates. So the use of water has not been sustainable. So the, the clear message and is in simply not directly for consumption but is also for irrigation. Of course you would you would ask but what about industry? Wouldn't industry use water as well? Of course! And if you go to uh, textiles for instance although we have seen recently a change in technologies but textiles still they use a lot of water not to talk about others that have a potential to contaminate water dramatically, such as mining in many different countries in the world. And the negative externalities are quite self-evident to the poor and they become a negative externality and, and we have children dying, well, and the elderly and all others who, the, who could be more vulnerable to contaminated water. But Keep in mind that this is uh, an issue for uh, provisioning. So when we go to regulating systems, we have seen that air quality overall has been uh, decreasing, the capacity for climate regulation as well decreasing. Erosion, it's a big problem for, um, uh, for ecosystems that are dedicated especially to these major crops. Again, the capacity of systems for water purification and waste treatment has been down as well. And things which used to be normal, such as, or normal more often, such as pest regulation or even pollination, have been down, partially because of excessive use of pesticides. Now, Brazil is just a case on that that's using um, additional uh, 60 pesticides which are um, increasing dramatically bees in the south of the country. So the whole issue of pollination here has uh, become a major issue of discussion but at the same time the lobby of big crops and um, big farmers so far has uh, won the favors of uh, the government. Now, and also uh, we should include the so-called cultural services here in this list, which are also assessed by the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment as on, on the down aspect. So there are many things uh, which would be included in those regulating services, such as air quality regulation because atmosphere would have an intrinsic ability to clean itself of pollutants and this ability has declined so some people say oh it's 10 percent more than 10 percent less than 10 percent is a center of gravity there 
The other thing is not simply the local, but as the regional uh, uh, climate regulation. And we know that there's a preponderance of negative impacts. And here we are talking about tropical deforestation, desertification, and, and it's not that where we have forests, rainfall is decreasing or is reducing. It's very interesting that rainfalls, they generate with, with the heat, they generate, they generate like um, a road of water. So the Amazon region has as much water above that would have in the river. And this water would go to other parts of the planet. So uh, when people say that the Amazon is the, is the world's lungs, this is completely wrong because the Amazon would uh, absorb as much uh, oxygen as um, it would produce, but not in terms of water. So uh, this, is, again, is a very important regulating services. People should think about, oh, if you want water in Africa and in Europe, or in even in other parts of Brazil, we should keep uh, the Amazon forests, yeah? And the same thing would go for um, water purification. Uh, we do have this problem of nitrate concentration that has grown so much in the last 30 to 40 years. So another issue that we have, as I mentioned to you, would be the issue of pollination and this is not simply a problem of the south of Brazil as I mentioned to you and pesticides but it is a question of global decline on that yeah now uh, on top on top we have seen an increase in the number of floods in the world so it's not a sort of linear increase it's a sort of exponential increase. This means that ecosystems, they do not have the same capacity they had before to cope with uh, rain and extreme uh, rain events. Now partially this happens uh, in cities because cities have uh, not been properly planned so uh, cities are much hotter than they used to be there are no places for uh, water when it rains to be absorbed by the earth. So floods increase and we know that uh, poorer people would live in these areas at a higher level of risk. So, but just, just look uh, at this exponential and this has increased more recently as well. So. Uh, everything that has been said before for climate change, that some of these changes, they are non-linear. So it's precisely that. It accelerates, there are some abrupt changes, some of these changes are irreversible, and, and the consequences, especially uh, on human well-being and on the human well-being of the poor, uh, they are much more dramatic. So this is a, is a line that hopefully would have clear by now. So uh, when we look at, for instance, uh, we have this map on slide 22. We see dry land systems. This is what I mentioned to you before that more than 40% uh, would, uh, would cover the dry land systems and you have 2 billion people living there and another 40% you have is that the poor living in dry land areas and most of that would be for developing countries. Now sometimes when we think about aid and we think about assistance and we think about how the world can be a better place altogether, we do have a problem because for people living in developing countries it's not simply about corruption and weaker institutions and that people do not have enough human capital and that one should invest in education. It's not simply about that. It's about the place they are living. They are coping with a much harder ecosystem and what they get, the services they get from the ecosystems sometimes are much more difficult. So um, 
of course, we have to talk about specific countries. Yeah, Zimbabwe would be a reality totally different from Nigeria. Um, but but uh, the principle stands. The difficulty of uh, the poor surviving and getting their livelihoods from systems where they have to cope um, with um, ecosystem services which are which are very very poor now you can see uh, on the slide 23 you can see how precisely in these dryland systems they were the ones with higher population growth and this is very bad news one would say now the main reason for that is that we are just reproducing poverty at a much higher rate than actually we can reduce poverty and you 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 will see that there's a, a close relationship between poorer ecosystems and higher rates of poverty and that happens and that's natural that happens because uh, precisely uh, because the poor cannot uh, study that much the status of women uh, would be much lower than would be in other places so women are much more vulnerable to have more children is more difficult for them to say no as well so there are many reasons we can talk about in Asia pregnancy here higher much higher in some of these regions so there are gender issues which um, mix with um, ecosystem issues and ecosystem services issues which uh, they together they define the nature of underdevelopment in some of these countries but we we can see how at uh, lower GDP you get higher population um, uh, growth and that goes with lower productivity so these two graphs together they are given this information so and then we can get to what we call the direct drivers or causes um, and then we have two pieces of information you have the color and you have the arrow yeah can you see that if you go to the bottom of the graph you can see that the drivers impact on biodiversity they can be from the very yellow that are low to uh, the red which is very high yeah and then you can see with the arrows the trends now the sad thing here is when you get one red with an arrow upwards or up simply and you can see that there are many of that and there are also many that are yellow which are low pressure but their trend is up for all these different ecosystem services that you can see on the left so overall this is not good news overall we would like to see them uh, lower at a better state we have them at a lower uh, state and when we have at a lower we have with uh, most of them with an upward uh, pressure so what to do what will happen in the future this, this is a very uh, key issue if these are the trends if for provisioning if for regulating if for cultural services what we have seen in the past doesn't provide any reason for optimism here what can we expect uh, that will happen in the future now this very much depends on the institutional arrangements that we are going to see in the future so it depends on on, on the nature of trade it depends on whether policies are going to be proactive which means that they will do things ahead or whether they will expect them to happen and then act which would be reactive so it depends on this combination now what the millennial ecosystem assessment has done is that they have avoided doing predictions because predictions are bound to be wrong uh, 
because we know that there are many different elements that might affect predictions. But what we know is that scenarios are possible. Now, what are the difference? Is that scenarios are not predictions. Scenarios, uh, they are quite often counterfactual. You say, if A and B and C and D would happen, we know that this will follow. But if, on the other hand, if instead of A we have non-A, instead of B we have non-B, and then we have C and D, a different thing will happen. So there are logical ways in which the future can be structured. But again, they do not say anything about the original conditions. They do not say anything about the factual conditions that might happen. Now what the MA has done is that the MA has built four scenarios. And they are simply a combination between reaction or um, proaction and uh, globalization. So let's go to the first one. Now the names are simply, I don't know, someone had fun in putting these names. Yeah. So the first they called global orchestration. So we have societies which are globally connected and they are concentrated on global trade uh, based on economic liberalization, but they take a reactive approach. So they, they expect things to happen. They expect ecosystem uh, services to happen. Once they have, once they have do, done that, uh, they commit to the reduction of poverty and inequality. How they do so? They invest into public goods, infrastructure and goods related to health and education. Now some would say that global orchestration would be what we had before the financial crisis. So we had trade, yeah, going at higher speed, but they are not still being able to solve issues yeah, proactively as we need to do for issues of climate change. If we are unable to solve climate change issues proactively, we know what will happen. So some people could say that would be global orchestration. Yeah. Then on the other hand, you have order from strength. Another from strength is what we are seeing more recently. Yeah, with Brexit, with uh, Trump, uh, with US and China, we are seeing regionalized and a world moving towards fragmentation, which is concerned with security and which is concerned with protection. So the best they can get would be regional markets and they would not bother at all to the provision of these public goods. So you could say that is the worst because it's missing the beauty of globalization here and being reactive, not bothering too much. So there's no wonder that you will see that there's a wall in the icon separating the haves and have-nots. Yeah? People who are more pessimistic about the future might say that we are moving in that direction from order uh, or yeah, order from strength would be would be the name. Then we have another one which is called adapting mosaic. So we do have this regional uh, concentration, it's not in a globalized world. But then you have societies that have a more proactive approach to the management of ecosystems and public goods and the goods for the poor. So it's regional, but they care. That would be, would be uh, better than other from strength if you, you compare. At least they would be able to be proactive uh, in terms of ecosystems. And then we have the so-called techno-garden. And techno-garden, so it's just a set of possibilities, so we have to go into globally a globally connected world which is using all sorts of um, 
technological fixes and then they use uh, all this high technology to increase the ecosystem services and they do take a proactive approach uh, to the management of the ecosystem. So it's, it's just a variation uh, techno garden because it's just what can be achieved but simply by the use of technology. Um, and this discussion would come from old debates from sustainable consumption because when scientists realized and when um, social scientists as well they realized that all the paths, the consumption paths would not be sustainable and that happened just before the Chinese and the Indians started uh, their more, more recent economic growth they understood well we cannot keep that so either people will have to reduce elsewhere their uh, consumption patterns or alternatively um, we would have to find technological fixes uh, dematerialization for instance is a way this has happened one cannot say it doesn't happen now we are using computers today which are much lighter and the batteries are incomparably lighter than what we used before so when we have things which use less material than before so they are more friendly from an environmental perspective but the question is is this enough would a techno garden uh, uh, be enough now they have provided some simulations and the horizon the millennial ecosystem assessment would have would be 2050. Now what is interesting here is that uh, through Techno Garden uh, adapting Mosaic and, and global orchestration would see something positive. Yeah? You have red for industrial countries, you have blue for developing countries. Now uh, one can see that it depends on the services to see the impact. Yeah? So the adapting Mosaic provisioning is not brilliant for developing countries one can see um, but what what and and partially is because it's regional nature so it cannot benefit from what would be uh, global nature but what is dramatic here is that if we go from order order from strength then the predictions that coming from this particular scenario would be fully negative. Now this is food for thought, this we should think about that, we should think about this characterization, we should think about the things as they are taking place not simply in the UK but elsewhere, politically elsewhere as well, uh, how uh, politicians and societies are building an understanding uh, which seems today closer uh, from or different strength than would be from those scenarios that have a stronger global character. Um, but again, these are simply some predictions. There are different examples uh, of changes in policies that would produce positive outcomes. So we know that global orchestration is centered on the notion of provision of public goods, so what's the education infrastructure, what would be the infrastructure for health, such as hospitals, other programs that could help uh, with poverty reduction. We also know from Techno Garden the key issue would be the investment and the development of technologies to increase the efficiency of ecosystem services. Of course, the main difficulty here is that the same technology that can increase the efficiency of ecosystem services could at the same time create new problems as we are going to discuss later when we see what would be the impact of artificial intelligence on, on, on the future of employment. So we know that things are not um, so straightforward as they could be because the same technology that could help on um, a certain aspect can undermine uh, a different side or a different aspect 
of, of the problem. And this goes without saying that here we are not specifying how we are going to, to solve that mix between markets vis-a-vis -vis, uh, governments because there are also ideological issues related here. So to conclude this discussion, um, the first point that I hope it's clear is that when we talk about sustainability, we can talk about paradigms. We can talk about the problems with paradigms. We can talk about the difficulties and how people disagree and how what they do has some philosophical underpinnings. You get an economist that normally would have a sort of um, utilitarian background and you get someone coming from, I don't know, biology or conservationist getting a more Kantian background and these people will have problems. But their problems quite often would have nothing to do with uh, the matter, with the thing they are discussing, but it has to do with the way, the philosophical underpinnings of their reasoning. So that's part of the discussion. But this doesn't solve anything. This allows us to understand the nature of the debates, the nature of the difficulties. But this does not solve the issues. In order to solve the issues, we have to get into a model such as this one. It's not the only one, it's just one model. It's one of the best ones, in my opinion the MA, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Model, but it, one, have, one has to go into the specifics of ecosystem services and what are the services and what are the impact of the services on different constituents of well-being and their corresponding freedoms. And then we can see that from, from the past to today we can uh, register certain impacts and, and we can see how to solve that. So, quite often, uh, when we talk about the environment, we have to uh, make clear, make it really, really clear that we are talking about resource allocation. And what are the economic backgrounds and incentives that are there for planning, for management, for decision making? So these are issues which are policy issues because the governments, they have to put themselves in place of people and some of these issues which are seen from an individual perspective as very straightforward. Yes, I'm going to produce and I'm going to pollute. Yeah, and that's not my problem. It's an externality. When they are seen from a collective point, um, it's up to governments. And sometimes it's up to several governments to look for a solution if the nature of the problem is global. If it's a sort of local nature, what well, would be local government? Now, of course, in an ideal world, stakeholders, as we call them, based on Freeman's 1982 terminology of stakeholders, so uh, would all get together and they would solve these collective problems. But we know that in practice, the issue of individual behavior is different from collective behavior. Things that might be uh, rational from an individual perspective might be irrational collectively. And quite often uh, issues which are environmental issues or ecosystem service issues, they, they have this nature. There seems to be one way forward, which is the use of environmentally uh, friendly technology or environment friendly technology. But the same technology that might help, uh, on the one hand, might be the technology that might undermine, on the other hand. So we have to see on balance what technologies are bringing, not simply to development today, but for development in the future. So we cannot talk about sustainability without technology these days. And at the same time, when we start a new chapter talking about sustainability uh, and talking about technology, we are back to sustainability because the use of technology can be unsustainable. And we are going to discuss these issues later. Yeah, unsustainable in the sense that we might get more from resources, but we might be creating some social problems. So if you think in terms of the pillars, 
yeah we solve the economic but we undermine the social or we solve the environmental but we undermine the social or undermine the economic so there are trade-offs here that have to be have to be solved yeah now hopefully uh, this discussion um, even being far from ideal yeah it's just a video and uh, it doesn't have the same dynamic that we would have in class so to a certain extent I'm very frustrated but that that was the only option yeah so it was a little bit bureaucratic showing things that uh, you couldn't see or perhaps you could see the video together with the uh, PowerPoint so but uh, hopefully at least could be a bit helpful um, and let's let's hope that next week I will be able to join you and then we can have a proper class yeah once again I apologize for any inconveniences you 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 might have with these arrangements uh, but hopefully it was again a bit helpful yeah okay take care see you bye bye